And now, Lord, as we look to your word, we pray for your Holy Spirit to teach us, to lead us, to guide us. This has been a great look at this uh, Gospel of John, and we pray for you to be leading this message and showing us what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so as I said there, we're going to be looking at the Gospel of John today, picking it up in chapter 4, verse 25. So if you want to follow along, that's where we'll be. And if you don't have a Bible and you want to follow along, we have spares on the back table, so you can either feel free to get up and pick one up or raise your hand, and the lovely and talented Vicky will bring one to you. So do we have any takers for that? Anyone need one? Bueller? Bueller? Okay, so the other thing I want to tell you is that once you find John chapter 4, you're also going to want to find and put a marker in for Exodus chapter 3. So Genesis is the first book, Exodus is the second book of the whole Bible. So it's way in the beginning of the New Testament. Ooh, Old Testament, just seeing if you're paying attention. No, I'm not, I made a mistake. Anyway, so find and mark Exodus 3, and we'll be turning to that in a little bit. But I want to start with this. A man who was getting a bit overweight decided to go on a life-altering diet. One of his main problems with his current diet was that he would stop for donuts every morning on his way to work. Mmm, donuts. Yeah. So to make things easier for himself, he changed the route that he drove to work to avoid the temptation of stopping for some of those delicious donuts. Once he got busy during the day, he figured he could more easily avoid the temptation if only he could get past the mornings. Now, as the weeks passed by, he began losing a great deal of weight and was receiving compliments from his friends and co-workers alike. Then one morning, without thinking, he accidentally turned down the road that would take him by the donut shop. Dun, dun, dun. Well, at first, he was going to turn around and head for safe territory, away from the awful temptation. But then he thought to himself, maybe the Lord is rewarding me for my recent efforts. So he shot up a short prayer, asking God that if this was his true intention, could could there be an open parking place available directly in front of the shop, awaiting his arrival, which, by the way, happened very rarely at the very busy donut shop. And sure enough, on only the fifth time around the block, there is his favorite spot right in front of the shop. Well, the moral for that is to think twice before continuing down the track that you're on. Our lives are like train tracks. We can get pretty set in our ways, but the Bible tells everyone that we need to change tracks when we're on a track that is not pleasing to God. So I call this message, Changing Tracks. Used to be going straight, and now, well, straight the way you were going, and there's an alternate route that God has for you. Now, John tells us in in verse 4, of chapter 4, that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Jesus is hot, and he's tired from walking through northern, or Samaria, walking north there, and so so he's sitting down by Jacob's well, and then a woman from Samaria comes to draw water from the well. So Jesus has been talking with this Samaritan woman, which of course at first shocks her, that he would talk to her, that he would talk to her because she's a woman and because she's a Samaritan. Because verse 9, John wrote, for Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. But Jesus does talk with her, and as the conversation goes on, she gradually changes her understanding of who he is. She goes from calling him a Jew to calling him sir to calling him a prophet. And today we'll see she gets on that right track with the Lord, because Jesus has just told her in verse 24 that God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So now she's ready to receive from Jesus. She's kind of having one of those moments like Gru in Despicable Me. I don't know if you saw that movie, but he'd say, light the bulb. So I have a slide to show what's going on in her head. Bing, the light has come on. And, of course, we know that Jesus calls himself the light of the world, so 
I figured I could get away with this, but you can go on to the next slide now, back to the title one. So verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will teach us all things. Well, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. At this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came to him. So, starting in verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will teach us all things. For all their dealings with false worship, they got this right. They had a lot of problems in how they worshipped, They were worshiping. They only believed in the first five books of the Bible. They had, we've gone over this earlier. If you need to, you can go to our YouTube channel and listen to the previous teachings on this. But you kind of get the idea. The Messiah was promised to come, and he will teach them when he does. They got it right. She called him Messiah, which means anointed. This is the Hebrew word for God's anointed one. John interjected in the parentheses there that the title Christ, which also means anointed. This is the Greek word for God's anointed one. So she had the right idea about the Messiah. This is what Jesus wanted her to think of. After all this conversation, he's kind of getting down to what we like to call the brass tacks, exactly what it means. J. Vernon McGee said this, how majestic and sublime this statement is. This woman is brought face to face now with the Savior of the world, the Messiah. Friend, this is my question to you today. Whoever you are and wherever you are and however you are, have you come face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ as this woman did? I tell you, she found herself in his presence. And now Jesus tells her, he answers her, he replies to her statement, he tells her who he is. In verse 26, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. This is where, as we like to say, Jesus hits the nail on the head. He's speaking plainly. But we, as 21st century, I started to type 20th century, and I realized, nope, we're 19 years into the 21st century. Catch up. (laughs) So as 21st century Christians in English-speaking America, we could miss what he said. And that's understandable because in the Greek, the words are in a different order than we see here in English, but we'll get to that in a bit. This is where we turn all the way back to Exodus chapter 3. If you want to turn there, this is where we'll go, and we'll start in verse 1 of Exodus 3. But I'm going to give you a little background. Through God's providence, Moses was raised in Pharaoh's house. If you don't know the story, it's fascinating. Start reading it in Exodus 1. If you do know the story, it's still fascinating. Read it in Exodus 1, starting there. Either way. But Moses is raised in Pharaoh's house. But as he grew older, he became aware of his Hebrew heritage. And when he was 40 years old, he took vengeance out on an Egyptian who was beating a Hebrew. In chapter 2, verse 12, it tells us, So he looked this way and that way. And when he saw no one, He killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. This is not a good plan. There are two major things wrong with this. He looked this way and that way, checking to see if anyone else was watching. Which way did he not look? Up. He didn't say, God, is this what you want me to do? He didn't check with God. (laughs) He took things, matters into his own hands. He had somewhat of an idea that this is a wrong thing to do or he wouldn't have looked this way and that way because he wouldn't have had to. He would have said, this is right, I'm just going to do it. So the next day, figuring everything is fine, Moses broke up a fight between two Hebrews. And one of them asked Moses if he was going to kill him as he did the Egyptian. You see, Moses actually had four witnesses to the murder of the Egyptian. Number one was the Egyptian, but he's dead. You know, he's not going to tell anybody. Number two is the Hebrew, who is very much alive and probably a pretty good talker, right? (laughs) 
Number three, Moses himself was a witness. Have you ever thought of that? When you do a sin, when you commit a sin, you're a witness to what you do. Oh man, that's one of the worst things that can happen because you can carry that forever. And then the fourth one, witness, God witnessed the whole thing. So the secret was out, probably through the Hebrew who was there being beaten. And so Pharaoh eventually found out about it and he was going to kill him, literally. So Moses ran away to Midian. If you saw the movie, The Ten Commandments, this is just one of the inaccuracies. Pharaoh takes him out to the edge of the desert and sends him out with only that little boda bag of water and that's it. You know, he banished him. No, it wasn't that dramatic. Moses ran away. He said, ah, Moses, uh, Pharaoh heard about it. I'm out of here. As my friend used to say, he went. And he got out of town. I just love that pose, so I had to do it for you. It's a guy running. It's like in a comic book. Anyway, so he ran away to a, an area, a region called Midian, and he met a man named Jethro, and he ended up marrying Jethro's daughter. Now, it's going to skip ahead a bunch. Forty years have gone by. It, Moses was 40 when this happened. So he's 80 years old. A lot of us figure we're dried up, useless at 80 years old, right? There's nothing more we can do. Moses started at 80 years old. So this is where we pick up the story in chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord, most likely Jesus, because that's the, what's called a Christophany or a theophany, but we'll get to that in a little bit. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, being Moses looking, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. So what was this? The first gas log. It's burning, and it's not burning up. So Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. This is amazing. God knew Moses, highly educated. God knew Moses knows things burn, they burn up. God knew that Moses, when he saw something burning that didn't burn up, it would get his attention. When it burned long enough, Moses would go and check it out. This is what's amazing. God knows everything about every one of us, and he knows just what it takes to draw us in. Now, we can be drawn into him and still reject him, or we can be drawn into him and yield and say, wow, Abba, Father, God. It's our, it's our choice. But he knows what it takes to get our attention, and he uses that, whatever it is. In this case, as I said, it's a gas log burning, and he doesn't understand why it isn't burned up. So he talks to him, and kind of like, um, well, I think Moses knew something odd was going on. So he wasn't shocked when he heard God talking to him, but he's still like, whoa, this is interesting. Kind of like Balaam riding the donkey. He just talks back and forth with the donkey. It's like every day. Maybe it happened to him all the time. Dr. Doolittle, I don't know what's going on, but here it is. Moses is in front of this burning bush. So then God says in verse 5, then he said, do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Now, I've said this many times before. If you've heard it a lot, I hope you don't get bored with this, but I just love the idea. God wasn't saying, my dirt is holy. Your dirt from out there is not. Don't you track your unholy dirt on my holy dirt. That's not what he was saying. What he was saying was, my presence makes the ground holy. So take your shoes off so you can touch skin to the holiness of this ground so we can get as intimate and close as possible. That is so much better than, don't track that dirt on my holy ground. You know, it's not like your house where you come inside when you're a kid, your mom goes, ah, shoes off, because you don't want to track that. In. No, he just wanted intimacy. He wanted to be as close to Moses as possible. So I love that. And he wants to be that kind of close to us too. So then he says in verse 6, Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, all great men from the book of Genesis. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. 
And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. God knows all your sorrows too. He sees them all. He knows it. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and all the parasites and everybody else. So, therefore, <laughs> behold, <laughs> so I apologize in afterward to all these peoples. But anyway, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. So he told them, I've seen it, and I know what's going on, and I'm going to take care of it, and here's how. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I bet there was a little bit of a pause, and then Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? You see what Moses had right there? He had an eye problem. He said, Who am I that I should go? Ay, 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 right? So verse 12, he said, I will certainly be with you, and this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. What's the sign? When you bring them out. Not if, not maybe, not you could, not good luck, bucko, you're on your own, pal. No, I'll be with you, and when this happens, so God is seeing the things that are not as though they've already happened, which is what God does. I'm going to be with you. Well, then verse 13. It's actually somewhat of a logical question. I don't fault Moses for this. Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel, that part he knew he could do, <laughs> and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, well, yeah, well what's his name? <laughs> what shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. This verse right here is the whole reason I went back to Genesis 3. And I had to give all that introduction so you'd understand how it fit in and why God said that. This name is the name of God. I am. Now, I've often said this. What an odd name. I mean, we have Bob, Jerry, Jeannie, Randy, Elvis even, but who's I am besides Will I am, I guess, right? William, he broke it up into three names. Will I am is a rapper, I think. And that's how much I know. But anyway, the point is this. No one goes by the name I am. So what kind of a name is that? You know what it is? It's the name of wherever you are in history. He's current. He's, he's, he's up to date. He's the God of what's happening now. And that means he is outside of our frame of time, if you will, the time-space continuum that Doc Brown talked about in Back to the Future. There's this whole time frame, and God is outside of it. He's I am. He can see past, present, and future simultaneously. Wherever you go to him, from whatever point in history, he's I am. He, only God can do that. We are stuck here right now. And now we've gone a little farther, right? And now we've gone even farther. And now we've gone even farther. Seconds have gone by. But we can't go back to where we were. We can't advance to where we aren't yet until it gets here. But God can be I am. The I am of God right this second is the I am of God when Melissa was leading worship. It was the I am of God when you were getting ready for church. And it'll be the I am of God when you're celebrating Memorial Day tomorrow. He's I am, he's current. It's important to know that. Okay, so now we go back to John chapter 4, and we look at what Jesus said in verse 26. I who speak to you am he. The word I is, in the Greek, is ego. And in M in the Greek is ame. Ego ame. Some people say ego emi. I think they're putting the, as my wife likes to say, the emphasis on the wrong syllable. <laughs> because that's the way we want to read it, to Englishize Greek. But the actual Greek pronunciation is ego eme. But this, what this is, this is what's called an I am 
statement of Jesus, quoting Exodus chapter 4, or 3, 3, yeah. So, seven other times in the Gospel of John, Jesus uses this I am title in addition to a specific description of himself. And I have the references in your notes, but not what he said. In John 6.35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. In John 8.12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. In John 10.9, Jesus said, I am the door. In John 10.11, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. In John 11.25, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. In John 14, 6, it's even on the wall behind me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. In John 15, verse 5, Jesus said, I am the vine, and he added, and you are the branches. Wow, there is so much to this Jesus that we know and serve and love. It's incredible. Now, there's at least one more, at least, there may be more. One more I am statement of Jesus in the Gospel of John, and to me it's probably the most compelling of all. If you are in John 4, just quickly turn over, same Gospel, just over to chapter 8. That's just four chapters to the right. You can get there. And it's verse, it's actually in verse um, 58, but what we'll do is we'll begin in verse 48. Jesus has just upset the Jewish leaders again, this time by telling them that they are not of God. Here here are the leaders of the Jewish religion. He says, hey, guess what, guys? You're not from God. You're not of God. You're not teaching God. You don't know him. No. And so they say, hey, thanks. Can you educate us? No. They got mad. (laughs) They got very upset with him. And so the Jews, verse 48, answered and said to him, do we not rightly say that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? whoa, it's like if you knew Jesus, you want to step back from them because lightning will come down and just consume them, right? Just like Elijah used to do. I don't know if you picked up on this, but they used the term Samaritan as an insult, okay? Do we not rightly call you a Samaritan? Remember what was the woman? She was a Samaritan woman that Jesus talked to. But they use this as a derogatory term, and they say, you have a demon. You've got to have a demon to say we're not from God. Who do you think you are? Earlier in the chapter, in verse 41, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. So the story about Mary being pregnant before they were married still carried on 30 plus years later. They were still saying that about Jesus. You know the term that they were calling Jesus when they said he was not, they were not born of fornication. I'm not going to use it from up here, but you get the idea. So Jewish has upset the Jewish leaders again. In verse 49, Jesus answered, he said, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. And I do not seek my own glory, and there is one who seeks and judges. Most assuredly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. Now, of course, we realize he means the ultimate death, being thrown into the lake of fire, separated away from God for eternity. But they don't understand that. The Jews said to him, now we know that you have a demon. <laughs> Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and you say, if anyone keeps my word, he'll never taste death. <laughs> I mean, I bet they had that tone of voice, too. <laughs> Are you greater than our father Abraham, who is dead and the prophets are dead? Who do you make yourself out to be? So Jesus answered, if I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my father who honors me, of whom you say that he is your God. Yet you have not known him, but I know him. And if I say I do not know him, I shall be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father, Abraham, rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. You're like, wait a minute. How did he say that? Okay, this is a little odd, because we know that Jesus wasn't born until New Testament times, and we're talking way back in the book of Genesis. How did Abraham rejoice to see the day of Jesus? Well, there was 
a meeting between Abraham and a guy named Melchizedek. <laughs> and that was probably, again, what's called, a, some people call it a Christophany, some people call it a theophany, theo coming from the Greek word, which means the study of things of God. So an appearance of Jesus before he came to earth in the body that he had when he was here talking with these guys, pre-incarnate visiting the earth. Because Abraham paid him tithes, he had bread and wine, a lot of things tie in. That's probably what he's talking about. But we know that it happened because Jesus said so. See, that's one thing that's nice about Jesus. He's never wrong, never lies. So then the Jews say to him, verse 57, you are not yet 50 years old, and you've seen Abraham? You know, you're not even 50, and that was thousands of years ago. What are you talking about? So Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. That's really clear. That's really plain. Not I was, not as the Jehovah's Witnesses in their translation say, I have been. They change it and say that. No, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Now, he's kind of mixing Bible history. He's not wrong, okay, because who did he say I am to? Moses. But he says, you know what? Before Abraham was, I am. That's what he's saying. He's saying the same I am that talked to Moses also knew Abraham and was existed before him. Jesus is saying two things here. Number one, he existed before Abraham. Number two, remember that whole burning bush thing? That God was talking to Moses? That was me. I was the one who was talking to him. It's pretty clear. It's what he says. Jesus is clearly saying he is God. And that's proven by verse 59. Then they took up stones to throw at him. Now, I don't know if they had like piles of stones in the temple area waiting to stone someone, but somehow they had them ready and they picked them up and they were going to stone him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple going through the midst of them and so they passed by. So Jesus is saying the same thing that he said to these guys way back here. We can go back to John chapter 4 now. In John chapter 4, Jesus is saying the same thing to this woman in, in, at the well, the Samaritan woman. Now, it may not look like it to us because, as I said, we are in America, we speak English. Or some people say we speak American. Our translation has, at least the New King James, I'm looking at it, I who speak to you am he. I is here, am is here at the end. So it doesn't seem like he's saying I am. Now the he, if you notice, if you have a New King James, or many other translations, you see it's in italics, which means it's not in the original Greek. They added it for what's called clarity. But it actually doesn't make it as clear as they may have wanted it to sound. Because even without he, it's still not that way in the Greek. Even if all you said was, I who speak to you am, it still doesn't quite make sense. Now in the Greek, the words for I, this ego, and am, and me, are not separated by four other words, but they're next to each other. In the Greek, in this section, this verse. I checked out the Greek, and they are actually next to each other in all of the seven I am statements of Jesus. Every one of those I am statements that I read to you, they're next to each other. Ego, eme. And even in this verse, and even in the one when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. A better literal translation of the Greek would read this, I am the one speaking to you. So Jesus told the Samaritan woman, he is the I am spoken of in Scripture, meaning this, he's God. I did find three translations of John 4.26 that put the I am next to each other, together. It's called Young's Literal Translation. It says, I am he who am speaking to thee but it still has the word he in it, even though it's in italics. The Hebrew names version says, I am he, the one who speaks to you. Again, that has he in it, so it's a little iffy. 
but the New Living Translation comes the closest. It says, I am the Messiah. And the M is even capitalized, just as it is in John chapter 8. So however you say it, if you base it on the Greek, which is the language that John wrote this gospel in, Jesus clearly stated to this woman of Samaria, uh, Samaria that he is God and that he is the Messiah she was talking about. The Believer's Bible Commentary says the Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. That's pretty cool. I love that statement. So, okay. So back to the storyline of what's happening here. She said, when he comes, he'll tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am, or I am, the one speaking to you, the one speaking to you, I am, however you want to word it. Verse 27, at this point, his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman. Again, remember, they were Jews. They were raised in the whole don't talk to a woman, don't acknowledge a woman, even your wife out in public. Remember, there were Pharisees who would see a woman and close their eyes and keep walking and walk into things and bloody their faces and get bruises and stuff. So legalistic. It's just dumb, you know? <laughs> But anyway, they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? The disciples were shocked that Jesus was having a conversation with a woman, especially a Samaritan woman, but you know what? They didn't interrupt. They were learning that their master knew what he was doing, and he didn't need their help, <laughs> even though later they do try. As John Corson says, after spending time with Jesus, they have come to expect the unexpected. Do you spend time with Jesus? If you do, have you discovered that he often does the unexpected? <laughs> oh, man, I have. But as a common saying goes in our day, you know what? It's all good. <laughs> when it comes from him, it's good. It's going to be good. It is good. And it was good before. Also, the disciples followed this advice. It's better to keep your mouth shut and appear a fool than to open it and remove all doubt. <laughs> Besides, there's plenty of time in the life of Jesus that's left for them to open their mouths and be dumb, <laughs> okay? And they do it. And we just go, how could they have done it so close to the end of his life, too? They've been with him almost three years, and they're still saying stupid stuff. Well, first of all, anybody here ever say stupid stuff? <laughs> sure. And we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They didn't have that yet. So let's give them a little bit of a break. But here they did well. They just saw her and they went, hmm. Well, if he's doing it, somehow this is okay. We don't get it yet. And you ever done that with Jesus too? You're like, boy, I don't think this is, a bit, but you're doing it. You are clearly doing this. This, this must be okay. <laughs> how in the world can you save that guy? <laughs> or how can you save that woman? What? You really are God. You really are big. If you can save that person, it can be amazing. So, verse 28, here is her response. The woman then left her water pot. I'm going to stop right there. This is fascinating to me. She thought the whole reason for her to go to Jacob's well was to get water. And she came at noon, even though it was the hot part of the day. She came then to avoid the other women of the city because they would come in groups in the mornings when it was cooler and they could chat with each other. But they didn't want, she didn't want to see them because she had had many husbands and she wasn't married to the man she was with now. Perhaps some of those women were married to the other husbands and she took them from them. Who knows? That's speculation, but it's a possibility. Whatever it is, she was trying to avoid any confrontations about her sin. But guess what? Jesus wouldn't have it any other way. He wanted to change her. He wanted her to get to admit her sin, her need for a Savior, and then save her. And it worked. What's the evidence? She left the very reason she went there, to fill her water pot. What did she do next? She went her way into the city and said to the men, hold on, we'll stop there. Why the men? Well, she doesn't talk to the women because she's not on speaking terms with them, most likely. <laughs> and perhaps she's ruined some of their marriages, so we can only speculate. But we do know this. She went to the men, which is interesting. The rabbi said it is better that the words of the law be burned than to be delivered to a woman. And yet, she went to men. Now, obviously, Jesus didn't agree with that, right? Because he met her where she was and talked with her and had no problems with her at all. She was so excited, she told the men of the city, what, 29, come, see a man who told me all things that I ever did. 
from what we read, Jesus did not tell her all things that I ever did. Now, perhaps they talked more. We don't know. But what we see is not all things. But he told her enough. And she possibly figured that from her conversation, if he knew that, he probably knew everything else. <laughs> okay? After all, he was right about everything that he did say. And she asked a very good question next, one that I think she knew the answer to. Could this be the Christ? This Messiah we're waiting for? Could he be the one? If she, if she knew about the Messiah to come, the men in the city would know about the Messiah to come too. And she wanted them to know that the Messiah had come and he had come in their lifetime. She just got saved. Doesn't she know she's supposed to wait years before she can evangelize? What's her problem? <laughs> Kidding. We can learn a lot from her enthusiasm. I think there's a tendency for us as Christians, as we get older, we get a little comfortable, we get a little more relaxed with Jesus, and we kind of go, yeah, well, if they learn about him, whatever, someone, someone else can tell them. You know, that someone else could be you. You never know. But anyway, how did the men respond? Verse 30, then they went out of the city and came to him. They went to see for themselves. I put this in my notes. Why? Well, if she's right, Jesus would be the most important man they could ever meet. J. Vernon McGee said this. This is pretty interesting. I'm just going to paraphrase it. He said that some of the men she was talking to could have been involved with her, and they'd be very interested in knowing whether he could tell all things that she had done. <laughs> better go check this guy out. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> but if this is true, this would just be another case of Jesus meeting people where they are, right? Whatever it takes to draw them in. And he does that with all of us. So I called this message Changing Tracks. Aren't you glad that Jesus makes it possible for us to change tracks in our lives? Well, I sure am. So let's pray. Father God, thank you for putting that switch in the tracks and throwing it in our heart and placing us in a, actually where, getting us to a point where we throw the switch because we have to make that decision. We have to be the ones who say, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner, I realize that. I'm in need of your grace. I'm in need of your forgiveness. And I know you've offered it to me. And I know you've provided that by your death on the cross by your shedding of your blood and by your resurrection from the dead and ascension into heaven and that glorious promise that you will come back for us. In the meantime, you're preparing a place for us. So we thank you for that, Lord. And if there's anybody here who doesn't know that, I pray that they wouldn't leave without knowing that for sure. That there is a God, that he is real, that he's there, and that he loves you. So thank you, Lord, and once again, thank you for the meaning of this weekend, this holiday, as we call it. It's more than just a day off from work. It's a day that we remember those who gave that ultimate sacrifice. So thank you, Lord, and pray for you to protect us till we get together again in Jesus' name. Amen.